Okay, I've shared the page. Yes, I've yes, been so the article with the Splash Runners and the group. Yes. I'm just having a quick... One moment, okay, so... I think about, I need to put some kind of picture or something on there, so I'll just... Okay, Sir Herc will be the one who will be. I think he's coming in, so we can give enough time for him. Um, but I will make you now as the host because so that if um, if there will be a um, if there will be a um, what is the the one that you're using for host? Anyway, yeah, we can still do it and um, yeah. You'll so see, um, okay. Yes, yes. Oh, um, no worries, but we can still uh, use this one. It's just that, um, of course, we can still make you a score. Besides, call control. So, are you starting now the recording, buddy? Not yet. Not, okay. not yet. I'll, I'll start the recording when Hook comes in. Okay, yeah. I'm so, just, um, if looking come, for in, Okay, is there people coming in? Okay, Mark is there. Okay. Cool. I'm just um, getting some. Check, I'm getting. Okay could, okay. could you check if we are live now? If we are live now on Facebook, if it's running now, because uh, to those who are on Facebook Live, um, good day. We are already starting. We have technical problems, so it might look like that. My ang the angle on my camera is different, or you don't see myself when speaking. Well, Facebook because... Live is Facebook Live has started. Okay, yes. Yeah. So, good day to everyone. So, this time for our Pinoy Athletics Lab Talk, uh, every Thursday is like an open mic session, ladies and gentlemen. So, our topic for this afternoon is related on the um, situation of the school varsity programs um, due to COVID-19. And we have two resource speakers, um, or should I say one, um, a, a Professor Hercules Calianta of Lyceum of the Philippines University, one of our presenters for this afternoon. And also our reactor is Mr. Christian Valiacer of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, who will talk about aspect on management and also some considerations on training, especially in the field of sports science and strength and conditioning. With me is my co-host, Andrew Perry, Level 3 coach of Athletics Australia. And also with me is um, Maki McClay of Nueva Vizcaya, who will be also sharing her reactions later. So um, we are both live on Zoom and on Facebook. For those who cannot log in, we are live on Facebook so that you can still type your comments and questions. Um, this is an open mic session, so meaning uh, pwede po kayo magtanong related sa athletics in any way. Um, in any capacity, we will try to answer those, your questions uh, on board and on uh, and live for this um, afternoon. So with me is Andrew Perry. So um, Andrew, um, since you already wrote earlier um, about the topic on on the um, situation of the varsity floor, can you give us updates on what you have researched? and um, talk okay. to some of the directors earlier okay. for five to ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. so far, um, I've spoken with, um, well, like we've we've seen documentation from Latran. Um, they po there was a memorandum posted around. Um, there has been news on TIP and Perpetual. And um, I have uh, messaged the director of FEU, but I haven't got a reply yet. But I did speak last night with uh, some uh, people with FEU who were basically saying that um, at this stage, their team's 100% intact for track and field um, at this point. Um, also, the US, with the UST, the Varsitarian came out with an article saying that um, that there were cuts of 30 athletes being made from the team. However, um, an, uh, there was an article which came out in Rappler this morning, basically saying that their team, uh, with Rappler, the Rappler editor talking to the IPA of UST and um, IPA basically stating 
to Rappler in the article that all their scholarships will remain intact at least until about December. Um, I also had a talk with uh, one of our guest speakers today, Mr. Hercules, uh, uh, from um, Lyceum, and he was basically highlighting with me some of the contingency plans that Lyceum has in place in terms of um, the fact there is, you know, the online learning aspect, you know, like he was, he had some very good uh, ideas about, you know, presenting uh, online learning modules to, um, or not just online mo modules, but also other means of correspondence in which the athletes can continue you know, getting the benefits of those studies. So, um, you know, some schools are looking at online type of stuff. Some schools are looking at, uh, um, like, possibly resuming classes at some point. Um, there is a variety of different uh, things being approached. As far as I know, um, there's really at the moment with FEU and UST, I'm still waiting to hear back from their sports directors in regards to the actual situation because there was um, information being given that, you know, some of the students of these schools have, have basically sort of shopping around for other schools which have vacant scholarships. But, you know, until we hear back from the sports directors of these schools, um, you know, we, we can't really confirm you know, what the status of those schools actually is at this point. Yes, yes, okay. Um, yes, um, yes, by the end. Uh, yes, that's right. So it's and a I, very... I'm waiting for them and I'm waiting for the response. Yes. To, um, to mm -hmm. these questions. Yes, that's good. So for uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a guest for this afternoon to share his um um, reaction or um, topics related to the situation of the university sports program or university athletics program in relation with the crisis created by the COVID-19. With me is um, the former dean of the UP College of Human Kinetics and also currently now the sport or athletics director of Lyceum Philippines University, one of my mentors at the University of the Philippines College of Human Kinetics during my stint as um, a master student in human movement science. I would like to say hello to Professor Hercules Calianta. Sir Herc, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear us? We're live now, both on Facebook and on yes. Zoom. Yes, good afternoon. okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, thank you, Rinpo, for, um, um, for um, accepting our invitation. So this, um, to give you the, the this program, it will be like an open forum type session because we have two meetings per week. The Talk Talk Tuesdays is mostly like an interview with a guest speaker. Like for next week, we will have Coach Henry Dagmil. But for Thursday, it's very informal type. It's like an open mic session. So anyone from Facebook or in Zoom can log in and then ask questions related to the topic for this afternoon, like um, about the sport and uh, sport situation or athletics varsity situation in uh, among sports in relation to COVID-19. So with me as co-reactor is um, uh, Andrew Perry of, um, uh, from Australia, a former consultant of the Philippine Sports Commission and my co-founder in Pinoy Athletics. And also with us is, of course, um, our colleague from UP, Diliman, College of Human Kinetics, Wisdom Value, Sir, and Maki McRae of Murit, Mur Academy in Webaya as our co um, guest for this uh, afternoon. So, Sir Hurt, uh, can you give us an initial update on the on the directives or policies now uh, of NCA among NCA schools in relation with the COVID nineteen crisis, especially for schools with um, scholarship programs? Where, but can you can you give us a um, um, situation or about this now? Well, I just came from the NCA Management Committee uh, meeting. Uh, as I told uh, Enzo when we talked last time, uh, all schools are hurt, hurting. We were, we're all hit by uh, COVID-19, hit hard. 
uh, because of the suspension of competitions, practices, and even classes. So most of the athletes went home to their provinces to be with their families. They're more stable with them. Those who were left in Metro Manila continued to be supported by the uh, for their by their schools. By and large, um, with respect to uh, the policy of the NCAA, uh, well, the NCAA recognizes that uh, it's really the IATF that uh, uh, dictates whether sports can, can be played already or not. And playing is different from competing. When you stage a competition, that entails a bigger crowd, that entails, even if you say that it's in, it's uh, behind closed doors and uh, no audience is allowed, the mere fact that you need officials, you need uh, coaches and players to gather around in one place, that's against the IATF uh, guidelines uh, on COVID-19. So because of that, the NCAA has to wrestle against uh, uh, the other collateral conditions that uh, resulted from COVID-19 and its ECQ uh, <clears throat> strategy. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, enrollment is foreseen to be low, so revenue will be low. So because of that, coaches, this is uh, across the board, Coach, some coaches were uh, uh, frozen, some coaches were, the, the, their contracts were allowed to uh, lapse with, of course, the condition that when normalcy returns, uh, they will be hired for or rehired for maintenance of the teams. Of course, it all depends as well on the financial status of the school. Now, some schools let go of uh, scholarships from their, for their students, which means that scholarships were suspended. Other schools maintained scholarships for their students, but uh, some of the miscellaneous fees will have to be handled or will, be, will have to be paid by the students. But other schools maintained a certain several teams only because the, 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 the NCAA is thinking of um, holding only competitions in the mandatory events for, 20, for, for season 96, which is this coming school year's season. Uh, those will be for uh, events only. So that's basketball, volleyball, track and field, and swimming. So some schools maintained scholarships for their student athletes in those events. Uh, others maintained across the board, like uh, Lyceum of the Philippines University, provided, still provides scholarship to most, if not all, of his athletes. Unfortunately, uh, the coaches' uh, uh, contracts were allowed to lapse because there is no uh, there is no uh, definite date yet as to when uh, competitions will start. And also, practices are not being held primarily because there is no physical, there's no face-to-face -face meeting. Most athletes are still in their provinces. So it is uh, conditioning is on a an individual basis. Guidance can be given uh, by uh, sports people or even uh, the athletes themselves who have been training for quite some time. So uh, that's it. Actually, all schools have been hard hit. And the range, the range of effects in terms of student scholarship uh, is uh, from no scholarship to with scholarship uh, and everything in between. Uh, other benefits such as, scholars, uh, such as allowances, dorms, and uh, meals 
have been suspended primarily because they, they're mostly in the provinces. This is across the board as well. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Sir Herc, for the um, for the um, situation there about this um, um, with the um, challenges of the school, especially in, in the NCAA uh, perspective um, due to COVID nineteen. Is um, next question is how do you think be, uh, on this situation that of course, as you said, some of the coaches were not um, renewed or like frozen, as you mentioned earlier. Um, is there capacity for any NC uh, for most NCAA schools to at least um, assist them in this kind of times or it's still a case-to-case -case basis on the economics or finances of the N among NCAA member schools um, can uh, you give actually, us actually yeah, yes, the, NCAA, the NCAA uh, recognizes that it's really difficult for the coaches and uh, uh, we recognize also that because it's their main source of livelihood it's going to be really, they're really going to be hard hit. So uh, we are presently uh, gathering data so that we can, uh, on their behalf, we can uh, argue for financial support from the government for coaches who have been uh, displaced you know, from their work. Uh, of course, this has to be argued by our legal counsel. Uh, we are, if you look at the number of coaches who have been um, affected, by the way, not only coaches, because when you stage a competition, for example, uh, you have your table officials, you have your, your referees, they are also hard hit. So we also included them in the personnel who have been hit badly by COVID-19 and its effects. And uh, we are doing a position paper so that we can actually uh, rally behind them for the government to give them subsidies or cash assistance for the rest of uh, uh, their non-employment. So that's other schools provided financial assistance. Uh, while some schools cut their uh, pay as early as March, other schools maintained them until the end of May, uh, even if it was already a lockdown. Okay. Um, I see. Um, Sir Herc, thank you. At least uh, we understand the plight of the coaches um, in this kind of um, situation. So the next question is, how about the athletes, especially those who are under the varsity systems? Because, of course, most of them are bound and also um, study under the varsity program or scholarships of their schools. So how now that we have COVID-19, we read in most news that some of them of their contracts or their um, studies are also suspended. And, and of course, the fact that most of our varsity students are studying among, especially in NCAA or in other leagues because of the scholarship programs for their varsities. So is there any, situ um, um, is, can you give us a light on how did the among NCAA schools manage this situation for athletes? Because of course they are bound by their contracts or any, um, upon their admission. So can you uh, give us a um, point of view there? Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, most schools still honor most of the contracts or most of the yeah, uh, agreements that the athletes entered into with the school. Uh, so as I said, some schools are still providing scholarships. Uh, you know, when if there is a semester that's going to be offered, if there is a distance learning program that will be offered, the NCAA, based on how it's going to honor eligibility for the next, uh, for, uh, for the coming competitions, we still emphasize that they have to study. So in other words, if 
the school wants them to compete for them, they need to enroll them. Okay? And, you know, this is actually a favorable condition for athletes because if the school needs your services, then the school will be uh, required to have you uh, um, enrolled. If you don't have the money, then the school has to uh, put up the scholarship for you so that you can be used as an athlete for the coming uh, competitions in the NCAA. That's very clear. Uh, the NCAA will not tolerate athletes who have not been enrolled uh, or, or in other words, if their enrollment have been cut for whatever reason, okay, the eligibility, the eligibility rules were relaxed a bit. For example, in the NCAA, uh, ordinary conditions demanded or required for, for, for athletes to enroll in 12 units and to pass 60% of the total number of units that they were enrolled in. Because of the possibility of dire consequences uh, facing some of the athletes, uh, we considered that maybe if they enroll in six units and pass 50% of that, it will already be acceptable for their eligibility. We, re we relaxed a bit our eligibility primarily because we recognize that if it's a distance learning mode, you know, whether it is asynchronous or synchronous, they will be hard pressed to stay, to do things outside of the face-to-face -face, uh, mode of uh, le learning. And this is the reason why we decided Let's give them all the leeway, provided they are enrolled. Because they're student athletes, they're not professional athletes. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Sir Herc. So it means that based on the situation and also the, um, the conditions, so meeting all students and all their contracts are continuous, meaning that they are still subject as um, admitted to or enrolled in their respective schools. So they are bound terms and conditions of their of their admission to the varsity program so it means there is um there the, the um, cancellation or should i say in um term of their contract as a um, student athletes is highly discouraged so meaning um hindi din ini encourage ng among nca schools na pauwi in or ikat or isuspend ang kanilang contracts as long as they still have this kind of conditions. Tama po ba, Sir Herc, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, to, clari uh, to clarify, you know, a lot of the athletes, most athletes went home to their provinces. Okay? And mm -hmm. they, they, they completed the second semester of 2019-2020 distanced, via distance learning. Now, those who went home uh, come enrollment if if they wish to enroll, and this is, I can only speak for LPU, the other, uh, 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 the other schools, uh, some teams, some athletes of some teams, they let go in terms of scholarships, okay? Because they cannot sustain mm -hmm. it. But, mm -hmm. but once in LPU at least, and in a lot of schools as well in the NCAA, if they are needed, for example, if they're going to compete in swimming or in track and field, they cannot be fielded in by the school if they're not enrolled in the first semester. So mm -hmm. that means the school has to, be, has to enroll them. And if they don't have the money, I mean, if the student doesn't have the money, then the school has to uh, put up the, the tuition fee. But I'm not talking about all athletes mm -hmm. because some, some athletes, some schools, because of their financial status, cannot anymore maintain all of the teams. I'm talking of the four mandatory events, swimming, basketball, volleyball, and uh, track and field. At least those four uh, events, all, all athletes of those four events have been maintained. I can say that. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Sir Herc, for that um, insight. Especially, I know it can be really challenging, especially for an administrator like you and among other administrators uh, among NCAA and schools from other uh, collegiate leagues in our country. So it's a very tough situation, especially now that um, uh, students, of course, still studying, but at the same time, they're also um, bounded by, the, um, by this uh, kind of situation. So for now, um, uh, I guess I have I have already done with my uh, with my question. So I give now the floor to my co-host and co-founder of Politics, Andrew Perry, for his set of questions. So Andrew, it's your turn for the questions. Um, if you have other comments for uh, Dean um, Hercalianta of um, LPU. Yep. Okay. So um, first off, thank you very much for taking out time to. Uh, talk to us, uh, Dean Herc, and also the conversation the other day. Um, I'm taking it from what you've said that, you know, school, different schools within the NCAA, um, we won't discuss the UAP because obviously that's an entirely different league, but with the NCAA, yeah. based on this meeting, um, the schools are in, you know, they each school has a magnitude of different challenges they're facing because of this COVID incident. Um, and, you know, different schools are applying, you know, different levels um, of cuts or whatever to remedy the situation to make sure that their existing athletes are still, you know, they can keep on as many of their existing athletes as possible if it means even cutting some other sports um, you did mention the sport, the four mandatory sports, volleyball, swimming, uh, basketball, and athletics. Um, does this mean to say that, th that these other member uh, NCAA schools have actually changed their decisions? Like I'm talking about Latran and Perpetual. Have they actually reconsidered their sports programs or was that not? really stated within the mancom actually uh, you know when we met um, there, there were several intimations of their status okay and yep. uh, you know athletes will try to get as much as we as they can from being a student athlete yep. now there were reports of uh, shopping around and uh, the, the uh, attitude of the Mancom members was this. If they want to go to your school because they have a scholarship there, I will allow them because it will yep. benefit them. So in other words, yep. in other words, it is not really a uh, standard uh, way that uh, the NCAA schools maintained athletes. Some have cut even within the mandatory event teams. Like for example, they used to maintain, this is just an example, if there, is, uh, there were 50 athletes in basketball before, including their, their pool, they cut it down to 30 and yep. let go of the 20. Or in track and field, if you had 50 athletes, they cut it down to 30 because that's all they can yeah. afford in terms of... Yeah. Uh, so, and some, some are still giving allowances while others, even if they're already in the provinces, huh? but others, yeah. uh, most, of, most of the schools suspended allowances because they are already with their own families. Yeah. So it's really a, yeah. a yeah. Difference, different ways of dealing with it. Yeah. Dean, what I heard was um, in the case of this uh, particular situation, um, what I've heard is that um, some students had approached schools um, for transfers, but the schools unfortunately had to say no because the thing is that the schools really you know, had to protect the existing athletes they have because if they take on the responsibility of bringing on more on already, you know, strained situation with no budget from enrollments and whatnot, then they can't honour that commitment to the athletes that they currently have at the moment if they were taking on, say, transfers. Um, in light of that, one of my other questions is, 
Um, with contracts with schools, I mean, you can probably speak for your school, but like you may know about other schools, the contracts between athletes and schools, are they actually written or are they, is there, is there actually written contracts in place? Yeah, um, most of the, uh, well, it's an agreement. It's uh, most of them, if, when they enter, they're not yet uh, of majority age. They're below 18 years of age. So the agreement is between them, between the school and the, the guardian, which means the parents, okay? It is written, but usually um, it can also be rescinded depending on several uh, conditions, among which are, of course, uh, it's natural to have disciplinary conditions being one of them, as well as uh, force majeure and uh, to a certain extent this is force majeure are the agreements between the okay let's say for example the agreements are usually between the parents and the school because you know like say for example a kid comes in and they're 17 but probably more likely with the k-12 kids are more likely to be about 19 or 18 when they come into schools and being as young as 17 as prior to the k-12 but what i'm saying is these agreements whether they're between the schools and the parents or the schools and the children if they're or the athlete, if the athlete, say, has already reached the age of maturity when he entered the schools, are these legally binding documents, these written documents that have been put in place? Like, yeah, actually, or are they just you know, written agreements? Yeah, actually, uh, in the Philippines, even if you're already of majority age, chances are if you get someone to play for you, the family is included, especially if he is a good player, a good athlete. Yeah. So he gets recruited, the whole family says yes to that. Uh, and uh, uh, as I said, the, the, the agreements are more often than not uh, honored by schools. However, uh, you know, this is a problematic uh, uh, situation because no matter how much you try to get something, from the school, if the school cannot deliver anymore because of the low uh, revenues coming from very limited collection or even very limited enrollment, then it becomes a problem already. Uh, and this is true not only among schools, I'm sure in other industries, uh, in, in sports, PBA as well as PBL, the, the live contracts have been I'm not sure if they have been rescinded, but a lot of the players who are now in the MPBL are also hard hit because their salaries, if they're not cut down to 20%, some of them have been given notice that they won't have salaries anymore because the industry, the, the company is really close to, to, to closing. Okay, um, before, I'll just ask something else before I address this question that Wisdom Valesa has asked. Um, okay, so my query is, you know, like when we're talking about sources of revenue for sports teams, let's say, for example, a school has different sports, basketball, athletics, volleyball, swimming, and, you know, like whatever, soccer or whatever else, they, whatever other sports they're going to have. Um, does the source of funding vary for these sports? Like, for example, are some are yeah. some sports are some sports funded by, say, for example, enrollment fees, which are now non-existent at the moment because of the COVID situation? And are some teams a bit more stable? Like, I don't know, like, for example, basketball always seems to find private sponsors a lot of the time. So a lot of, bas a lot of schools' basketball teams are still intact. Um, do, but do, do, do some teams have different sources of funding besides money which is coming in from school fees? Perhaps, I don't know, alumni or private enterprises like sort of giving money towards a particular program? Yeah, actually there are, uh, 
well, you know, schools can can be sponsored by big companies or uh, philanthropist individuals who have now who who have uh, a lot of money uh, at their disposal. Other schools just get them straight from uh, their their revenues, which means uh, tuition fees. Uh, yeah. You know, some schools are blessed because they can be supported by San Miguel, for example. Uh, these schools have very lucrative uh, sports programs, not only for the players, but also for the coaches. But other schools are merely uh, fa financed by the school itself because the school sees it as a way of promoting uh, school and eventually enrollment and this is the reason why if there's no enrollment then the first thing that gets cut is uh, sports and advertisement which usually go together yeah that's right I mean some schools have big sponsors like SM for example um, but we'll address Wisdom Valesa's question. I had a similar question, which I will tie in with Wisdom Valesa's question, but I'm guessing um, he's asking more your opinion on this. Um, his question is, due to an extended time of relative inactivity, will there be a higher risk of injuries when sports competitions resume? And how can we mitigate the risk? I'm guessing... Um, he's asking, is there any online training in place or, you know, any um, way of continuing with that training, even if the athletes are not, um, you know, like physically with the coach or whatnot? Is there any way yeah. that, you know, that these athletes are going to train? You, you just did say before that the coaches uh, have to wait, you know, like as the, their contracts have lapsed. But, you know, but um, basically asking is in regards to Wisdom's question is, is there any form of online training going to take place for the student athletes during, uh, you know, what when at the same time that they're going through their online learning? Oh, yeah. Actually, uh, I can only speak for my athletic department in LPU. Uh, I will give credit where credit is due. Even if the coaches have already, uh, well, their, their contracts have been allowed to lapse, a lot of them still uh, minister to their, to their respective teams. Uh, yes. Through uh, online training, uh, their, their, main, their main reason is, after all, I won't be doing anything anyway. And besides, because these are my players, we have already been... We've been together for quite some time and I, I understand that they will still be part of LPU athletics. So might as well give them something, guidance no? uh, for their yep. off-season training. Aside from so, that, uh, aside from that, actually, the NCAA recognizes that, that it will be, uh, we would not want athletes to get hurt competing, especially since they will come from relative inactivity. I mean, relative because they haven't been practicing uh, strictly. So the NCAA, if ever it's going to come up with a season, will count back three months to announce when the season is going to start to allow for the return of players to serious practice before they are allowed to compete. Uh, so that means if, if the NCAA is, is uh, visioning going back to the season by February, the callback of athletes must come in by October or November, which means even if the coaches is not yet there, they will have to uh, strictly uh, provide us with uh, evidence that they are training, even if there's no physical face-to-face -face classes yet. This will, well, actually, this is what they did. The, the, the coaches did before uh, 
May, they were con continuously monitoring their athletes as if, as in daily, daily or at least three times a week, they were required to submit videos of their training sessions. So that yep. can still be done, of course. No? And I think, and I'm, sh I, 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 I can speak for my coaches. They were very honorable in uh, saying that they will continue to minister to their athletes uh, for their for the for the for the athletes to be ready if ever the callback comes soon. Okay. Um, well, and yes, it's um, good to know that you have a uh, loyal group of coaches who are willing to, you know, still help the athletes they've started with, even if um, you know there's financial. Uh, issues and they're not able to be paid. They're volunteering their time to help out. It, it's good that you have coaches who are that um, loyal and who really want to help your players be the best they can be, even if they have to make a bit of sacrifice. Um, it, it's yes. good to know that there are still people around like that. Uh, Ernell, would you like That's to why start? I said credit. I put credit where credit is due. Okay. Um, uh, buddy, uh, we will uh, um, accommodate some of our questions. Uh, thank you, Sir Herc, for for joining us. So we hope that you can hold for the next 15 to 20 minutes. So, um, Maki Makri from um, Nueva Vizcaya um, asks, um, what will happen to hiring athletes who had either already passed buyout or who were lined up for buyouts in different universities? Won't deep impact varsity system as a whole if they don't take in incoming freshman athletes. There was already limited recruitment as we know because there are a few years because of K-12. So can you I, I hope Dr. Herc can go get uh, Sorry, you were a little bit choppy with the question. Can you repeat um, that, please? Okay, uh, I, um, I will also type, it's all, also on Zoom chat if you can read the Zoom. So again, okay. Yeah, so Maki Makri asked the question and then while on those who are on board on Facebook Live because we also are simulcast on Facebook Live because the impact of the bandwidth in the Philippines. We have also questions there so we will accommodate. We will post as well your questions on Facebook Live and then uh, we, um, okay. I will reply here on the um, chat on Zoom sometimes you okay. can with my voice is um, having connection challenges. Sir Herc, did you see the answer. question? Yes, okay. yes, I did. Continue, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, for those who tried out and already passed the tryout, um, they, at least in, in the case of LPU, they are included in those athletes who will be provided uh, tuition fee discounts or uh, yeah tuition fee discounts actually to streamline to streamline the scholarship uh, granting uh, there is a certain number of athletes per team okay uh, and this is what and the, the, the LPU is going to uh, maintain in as far as scholarships are concerned. Beyond that, if you have been recruited because you are a uh, potential for the next two to three years, then the coach has to make a good, a very good argument for you to be uh, included in those who will be receiving scholarships, granting that your uh, utility to the team hinges a lot on what will happen during your practice practices? Sometimes these athletes are recruited as a potential and they're given only approximately 50% discounts or 75% discount from uh, tuition fee, which means they will still have to shoulder some amount of uh, uh, cost for the education. By all means, they will be um, maintained except if, as I said, they fall outside of the number of 
uh, players who are supposed to be kept within the within a particular event. Uh, our formula for that is whatever is the number of players in the lineup. For example, if it's basketball, 15, 15 players, we add 50% for the pool. So 15 plus 8, that's 23. So you have 23 players who you can uh, uh, put under scholarship. Now, if ever there is, uh, uh, there are three, four, five athletes who, who the coach feels uh, are, are almost neck and neck in terms of their abilities and potential, then the 20 scholarships can be split so that more students can be accommodated using uh, only 75% or 50% uh, scholarship. Uh, that's, a, that's dependent already on how the coach will play around with the number of scholarships that he has under his uh, control. So there will still be a lot of uh, discount. Uh, if let's say the tuition fee is 50 or 60,000 pesos, a 50% discount is 30,000. A 75% discount runs to 45,000. So uh, there will be a sizable enough amount of discount for the athletes to consider. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yes, uh, okay, thank you, sir, Herc. Um, next question is from our Facebook um, viewer, was also on the chat box uh, on Zoom so that you can read as well, but I will also read it. Uh, will schools now look towards trying to move to a more business model in order to avoid similar situation in the future? I mean, will schools look towards more sponsorship for student athletes rather than reliance on school enrollment funds? That's the question of Russ Gila the, from the Facebook um, comment section on Facebook Live. Sir Herc, um, you can also read it yeah. on the group chat. Actually, your question... That is already the, pro the prevailing uh, condition. Uh, no, no school will want to, to uh, spend all its money on its athletics program. So it's always looking for sponsors to support its athletics program. Uh, of course, there are limits. For example, uh, in our case, we do not, we do not uh, entertain uh, sponsorship proposals from cigarette, uh, <laughs> cigarette uh, corporations or yes, liquor, yes. yeah, because that goes against the grain of sports. Yes. Okay, so uh, by all means, we look for sponsors. If not for the whole team, for a whole team, or for the whole athletics program, at least for individuals. And there are some who have already been supported by individuals. But as I said before, everyone is hurting during this COVID-19. Pahabaan ng PC, no? Yeah, exactly. If your resources are big and, and uh, humongous, then you can stay longer supporting your uh, athletes, your programs. On the other hand, if unfortunately you are blessed with a uh, business model where your program is being fed by finances coming from the school with uh, a little bit of support from outside, then chances are you will be forced to cut your program to, for survival. Uh, thank you, Sir Herc, uh, for that, um, insi uh, for that um, insightful um, comment. Then, um, Okay, we will now um, read other questions or comments, of course, uh, from Mirazol Sunga, the usual challenges, of course, the budget. Of course, that's why, as, as Sir Herc said, we should follow really uh, ways to seek other means of funding, like sponsorship, but of course, in line with the ethical and also the um, trust of the universities, like Sir Herc said in the um, example of LEU, is that they don't accommodate sponsorship from um, the core cigarette, cigarette companies, which is in contrast with the, of course, with the sport or with the 
um, principals of the school. So, of course, uh, on the context of example, in the school where I was formerly working, our, um, our president is very keen not accepting um, um, sponsorship those who are involved in not so good environmental practices because that is also the plus of for, uh, in Mindanao that we are uh, the university uh, for example at the university is very keen on its um, purpose of making sure that um, we are uh, advocating um, sustainable and economic uh, environmental protection so that's why um, those who are not involved uh, those involved in not so good environmental practices are not accommodated in terms of... Uh, you'll, you, you'll be surprised at the range of sponsorship uh, proposals. Uh, some sponsorship proposals may come from uh, bars. <laughs> some may come from uh, uh, shady businesses. Yes, that's, why, that's why when there are proposals, we look at the profile of the company and even the, to a certain extent, uh, conduct some uh, character investigation with respect to uh, the owners because you do not know maybe it's a, a money laundering uh, company. So the schools have to do due diligence in approving proposals uh, for sponsorship. Yes, uh, thank you, Sir Herc, for that. Okay, so any uh, um now we will give um time for okay actually wisdom value sir should be one of our reactors. Um, Maki Macri of Muiwils Academy Nueva Vizcaya, if is um if you would like to um comment on our discussion this um afternoon, Maki, are you online? Hi. See okay. You. Yeah. Yes, um, you can uh, provide your comments or questions to Sir Herc um, in relation to our discussion about the situation of uh, varsity sports program in time of COVID-19. Yeah, um, first and foremost, hello po. Parang hi. This is a little bit like a reunion. Hi, Sir Herc. Hello. Hi. Parang kung bumalik sa classroom mo, Sir. So yeah, um, in terms of the scholarships uh, for athletes and what they're facing now. I'm sure pretty much everyone or a lot of people have already seen yun nga, the articles that we were talking about, certain athletes losing scholarships. And from an admin perspective, because I do work in the administration of a school, I do understand where the schools are coming from. We do have to cut but um, you know, certain things out from the budget. That's that's perfectly understandable. Otherwise the entire school system will collapse. However, I also feel as a, as a former athlete and as a recipient of the scholarship, you know, how devastating it can feel, especially if, you know, you don't really have a lot of options. Yes. Um, I think this is primarily a concern among bigger universities, particularly there in NCR and other metro cities, um, who do have major scholarships um, up for grabs. Here, because in the province, as far as I know, actually, we are the only school that offers varsity scholarships at any level. Elementary, uh, well, high school and uni university. We don't have a university sector, but not even our universities offer it. So it's not as big of an issue here. It's more of an issue, I think, for athletes who need the scholarship to get into a university in Manila. Because especially with the level of competition, the OPCAT results were just released you know, more than 100,000 took the test. About 10% got in. And how many of those could have been some of our athletes? And I add this to the concern with, again, my question a while ago about recruitment, about not being able to recruit a few years ago because of K-12, to you know, how many graduates did we have? Ilan lang yung na-recruit na into the universities? I'm a little concerned lang, I guess, with how how it will survive as a system in terms of varsity because you have the graduating um, players and especially for team events when you need you recruit how many how many in a year including the training pool and if we cut budgets I'm concerned lang also with the quality of athleticism that we can expect from our athletes again also in relation to um, Sir Wisdom's question. Hi, Sir Wisdom. You're still here. Um, 
yun nga, ang tagal na natenga eh. Not, not everyone has internet access. Not everyone can avail of the online training programs. Here lang in my province, a lot of our athletes who came home here, they go home to places that don't, don't even have cell signal. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going, I'm, parang, I'm starting now to think how we can get everything back on track once everything, you know, goes back to the new normal. I guess that's, that's my primary concern, apart from, my, you know, the graduating athletes in high school who were kind of hoping to get into a good university via scholarships in, you know, in, in certain that's yeah, actually, that's a, that's a very, very va valid concern because uh, overall recruitment definitely will have to be pared down. Uh, if you have a very competitive team, you will have to protect that team. And so the number of athletes whom you will bring into the system will be limited. Uh, yes, that's a valid, very valid concern. Uh, and that's the reason also why, uh, well, in the case of LPU, uh, as soon as the player or even the coach, as soon as the coach gives us uh, a list of recruits, potential recruits, we immediately ask them, even up to now, we ask them, look, this is the, this is the spot that you are, these are the spots that you are uh, entitled to. These are the slots that you are entitled to. And based on your team, how many slots will you open up? It's all up to you. Actually, previously, this has also been the practice. However, with the cutting now, I'm sure it will be streamlined even farther so that it's true. I'm not sure how this can be uh, alleviated uh, maybe this is uh, a bitter pill to, to take for the sports program because as we all know, we have been bringing all of our athletes to Manila while uh, competitions in the provinces, development of sports in the provinces has not been taking place uh, as, as well as, as they should be. So maybe this is one way that competition will also rise up in the provinces. Uh, some of the athletes who I, some of the coaches that told me, sir, paano yung uh, ni, ni recruit ko from Zamboanga? No? Na sana papasok sa atin. Sabi ko sa kanya, wait, ito yung sasabihin ko sa iyo ngayon. It's impossible for us to bring them here. Okay? Because that will entail a lot of uh, costs. Secondly, we do not know when they're going to compete. Now, in Zamboanga, what is happening right now? Maybe now you can play the role not only of a coach for LPU, but as a coach because that player, I'm sure, elected to go to you because he values your, your uh, way of thinking, your philosophy, maybe even your, your uh, way of your methods. So maybe you can ask him, to look for other uh, options within the province uh, until such time when it is already, when everything has returned to normal. On the other hand, maybe this is the, uh, what, what needs to happen so that in the provinces, the schools who are in the sports program seriously no, can step up and bring about uh, not only good athletic programs, but also the, the uh, student athletes can be treated as they should be treated, as students first before athletes. So I, I'm, I'm looking at this in a, a positive way because of course all the negative things, it will, they will all overwhelm us, but we must look, we must continue to look for something that is positive that maybe will turn the tide towards uh, COVID-19 and its resulting uh, uh, conditions uh, positive 
for other people. Okay, uh, thank you, Sir Herc. Um, again, a very interesting uh, discussion. Okay, so now I turn out the microphone or the Zoom mic to one of my colleagues in the former UP College of Human Kinetics, uh, my batchmate, of course, on a personal note at the MSHMS program. Uh, as Professor Wisdom Value, sir, for your comments or reactions. Then we will also still accommodate uh, questions, Sir Herc, if you would mind to stay further, if possible. Um, sir Wisdom, for your comments. Um, um, Professor Value, sir, are you on board? Hi, uh, good afternoon. May you know? Oh, online hi. tayo, live via hi. chat. So, hi, everyone. Hi, Sir Herc. Uh, hi. So, yung, 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 um, in question, because it's, it's more of uh, it's more of something to think about. It's more of, so everyone can can weigh in on this now. So uh, just like most people, I can't wait for sports to return. Because we don't have any pinapanood masado eh. Now <laughs> that being said, uh, we can't fully guarantee the safety of our athletes from the ongoing mm -hmm. uh, coronavirus pandemic. So if, if we do bring back sports and we accept the fact that we can't fully guarantee their safety, does that not bring about an ethical burden on sports administrators? That, that's my question. Sir Herc and every, uh, others can also weigh in on that one. Ila. Thank you. Uh, can, can you repeat that, please? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, so the since since we can't guarantee their safety sat when oh, yeah. sports returns, does that does doesn't that bring about an ethical burden on sports administrators in general if ever we do bring back sports? Uh, yes. I, I I believe so. That's why the NCAA uh, look, even if the IATF already said uh, it's already good to do swimming, to uh, play badminton and table tennis. Look, I told, we, this is the position of the NCAA. This is to play, not to do a competition. <laughs> it's, those are two different things. You can play to enjoy the sport. But when competition is staged, you're talking of a logistical nightmare. <laughs> Yeah, you gather them all in one place and you cannot prevent them from talking to each other. And when they compete, there's a lot of uh, uh, virus clouds. They're, they're generating a lot of this. And everywhere there will be the danger of uh, transmission. So as far as we're concerned, it's the IATF uh, regulations and even that. I'm sure even if the IATF will already say, okay, it's already okay to do this. Some schools will still look at this with, uh, with a lot of caution because once something happens to your athlete, it is you, it is the, the school which will uh, be blamed, will answer for everything. And it's not really, I mean, here you are trying to, streamline your costs and uh, making it as efficient as possible then you come out with out of recklessness out of uh, your just wanting to come to start competing that's why the NCA is pro proposing whether you like it or not whether you agree with it or not esports for the meantime <laughs> no at least and and the esports that we are thinking about should involve our athletes no? So the athletes of the NCAA will play esports. At least they will have something uh, very, very close to sports to, to do. Um, this is all that we can do. We cannot even, as a, as a management committee group, we cannot even meet face to face. <laughs> so yeah. how much more to, to uh, organize a sports competition? Okay, uh, thank yeah. you, sir. Uh, 
Kirk, and thank you, sir, with uh, Professor Wisdom Buddy, sir. So, so as uh, I on a personal note, para nag-reunion tayo ng exercise physiology class natin sa, sa CHK. Yan. So, uh, I'm glad that we're all here. Uh, Mark, you can also browse the questions on our group chat or comments if you'd like to react on those. By the way, we would like to acknowledge as well our friends from media. Uh, Miss B. Lauren Go of Rappler, who's also on board. So, Miss B. Go, if you're um, if you're around, you can also type your questions or comments, or if you want to speak out, you can also free to do so. So, Sir Herc, I give you the luxury to browse on the um, chat if you want to answer some of the questions or comments there uh, for your convenience, because I cannot read yes, the questions because of technical difficulties. I guess the bandwidth sure. in Philippines is very different most of the time. So yes, while I also browse on the Facebook Live questions, uh, I will do shout outs on those who are participating as well uh, for a few seconds. Um, Maria Mirasol Sunga, Gilbert De Lima, Nilo, Ninoy Marayag, Ramil Torregosa of Davao, Tess Rombawa of Bulacan, um, Ross Gila of Australia, if I'm not mistaken, and also Campus Echage, Baler Bolpa, Dabao City, Al Ryan Labita of uh, Calabarzon, Jonathan Espiritu, and others. Thank you very much for joining us both on Zoom and Facebook Live, and also to those who are also in Zoom. Sir Herc, did you select it already? What do you like to comment, etc.? Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, actually from Maki McRae. She asked, sir, is it possible for the PSC, for any other sport organization or agency, to really dole out a systematic plan on developing sports around the country? Because she asked, uh, it's grassroots that will really have to be uh, pushed, especially because we are now becoming more regional than centralized in Metro Manila. So the, the different regions will have to come up with their own sports program. Uh, so she's asking whether PSC or another organization can come up with a program for this. Actually, this is what I have been dreaming about, a sports program that will develop sports for what it is supposed to be. Uh, I always maintain this. Sports can have three different purposes as well as concepts. Sports for all, sports for good, and sports for sports sake. When you look at sports for sports sake, this is what you see that is very heavily commercialized. Who benefits from this? The, the advertisers, the athlete himself, and possibly his family. But as far as um, country is concerned, as far as uh, uh, the sport itself is concerned, Maybe in terms of popularity, yes. But for the whole country to benefit from sports, we have to orient ourselves towards sports for all, which means everyone should get the chance to play, the, play sports, which means that you strengthen the base from where you get your talents. This also redounds to sports for good because Aside from monetary benefits, there are a lot of other uh, positive traits, positive things that you can get from sports, among which are character building, uh, uh, produ producing a healthy citizenry, uh, making use of uh, the Bayanihan cooperative spirit among the people. That will develop. And to a certain extent, it's sports for all and sports for good that will set the base for the medals that will be won later on. I guess that's that's what I wish uh, uh, that can that we can see in the Philippines at the moment. I'm not sure who is supposed to do this, okay? But maybe this has to be uh, campaigned for. This must be. Uh, promoted among uh, the different athletic programs and athletic events so that we can actually look at a better future than just 
For example, Manny Pacquiao winning. Yes, bragging rights. But what does it do to the Philippine nation? You still have a lot of cri criminals uh, who are emulating uh, how Manny, Manny Pacquiao boxes, but not emulating his character. So this, this has to come into the picture. Okay, thank you, Sir Kirk. Um, we can, I hope we can still hold you for five to ten minutes further. Um, okay, lang po ba? Do we have enough time, pa? Sure, sure. Or, okay. My, my next meeting is at four. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> okay, lang. Uh, so I think local time there is three three thirteen. So we hope by three twenty five we can yes. wrap up. So some announcements, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, uh, for the public information, we are having two times a week forum via Zoom and Facebook Live for the Track Talk Tuesdays and Thursdays of Pinoy Athletics. So some announcements, ladies and gentlemen, for our Tuesday forum, I will show you now. So we have um, our next edition of Track Talk Tuesday. We'll be having our live um, forum with Coach Henry Dagmil of South Cotabato, our um, Olympian and also currently holding the long jump record for the Southeast Asian Games or the Southeast Asian record record in long jump. It will be on 9th of June, 2020, 2 p.m. Philippine time. Um, kindly email any inquiry for the Zoom link, but we will also have our Facebook Live as well. And the reactor will be another Olympian, which is uh, Ms. Akiko Thompson Guevara, the president of the Philippine Olympian Association. Again, June 9, Tuesday, 2 p.m. for the Tuesdays with our special guest, our Olympian and SEA Games record jump, uh, SEA Games long jump record holder, Henry Dagmil. So, so some announcements. And then we would like to thank you as well for joining us this um, um, afternoon or morning here in, 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 the, in Hungary. So, um, Sir Herc, you can still browse one or two questions on the group chat and then we, we won't hold you that much while I'm also taking time to send shout outs for a few seconds to our uh, participants on Facebook Live. So, um, Russ Gila of um, Australia uh, commented, I like the Dean's vision. So, how many students participate in the schools at the schools? Um, Lady of Batangas um, province um, said, shout out, good afternoon. So, Sir Herc, one or two questions on the chat box and then we can wrap up for the day. Hi, Sir Herc. Can I ask a question? This is Beatrice from Rappler Po. Sure. Yes. yes uh, so what is sure. the worst case scenario for athlete scholarship next school year, like if the pandemic still persists? And do you have plans moving forward to prepare for the worst case scenario? Uh, well, actually, the worst case scenario is uh, for us. No? This is already it. Unless, of course, if COVID-19, you know, it's good that GCQ is already uh, ongoing, although the people have to be educated more about what GCQ really means and what it, it entails. But if uh, vaccine is not yet available by that time, then we'll have to re rest reconstruct, restructure programs. Um, you know, uh, while we have been trying to look at uh, the future and something worse, on the other hand, uh, what, what we're trying to do is uh, build on what we have at the moment, try to uh, look at our options and because distance learning or uh, yeah, distance learning is uh, going to be the norm for the meantime. And that means that uh, enrollment might come low the NCA has to be able to look at some alternatives such as uh, suspending first the uh, traditional sports uh, events and possibly coming up with events that can be played as exhibition no? or as uh, over the internet. This has to be done because otherwise you will all, we will all end up stopping everything. And this is also in, in line with what uh, schools are envisioning. They have to promote distance learning uh, aggressively because this is, I mean, education doesn't have to stop, okay? 
even if uh, COVID-19 is still there. Uh, so the schools are doing its, uh, their best to promote distance learning so that when distance learning takes place, at least revenues can come in. And it's only by, the, by those revenues that we will be able to, to uh, sustain whatever we're doing at the moment. And to follow up on what you said about the NCAA, are there, is there a possibility that member schools will skip the next season due to budget constraints? Uh, that was, uh, I mentioned the name of Bea Mil Mil Milyar Koyata or somebody. She got the wrong information that LPU is looking at uh, the possibility of uh, uh, skipping next season. There was nothing, no, no school in the NCAA is entertaining that because of two things. First and foremost is the NCAA will do its best to allow even the most challenged uh, institutions to participate. It will not make it difficult for the uh, member institution who is already hard pressed to participate even in just one uh, tournament or one, one uh, competition. So uh, as far as the NCAA schools are concerned, I don't think there will be anyone among the member schools who will uh, take a leave of absence for next year. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Sure. Yes, um, okay, so I guess um, one last, um, last, five min uh, last five minutes, sir, Herc. So, the comments or questions uh, for your convenience and then we can, we can wrap up then, because the second part, while, uh, when you're already, um, after the, your talk, it will be like an open forum for a session, what we call it. Pardon if I don't have my cam now because I'm using my my phone for the camera because my laptop doesn't work. My the cam of my laptop is not working for technical reasons. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so five minutes more and then you can still browse her while I do the shout out seconds. Uh, um, so we thank as well again those people who join us uh, again. Um, I'm shouting out those who participated in our um, Patrick Manalang of San Pablo City Laguna, salamat. Then Randy Puentes Tilbe of Mandaluyong City, who's also joining us, uh, who joined us, and Miss Lady Lee of Batangas Province. Uh, good afternoon. So Sir Herc, um, final um, yeah. final um, browse on the comments or the actions, and then we can do a lot. To uh, react on what Enzo said here, Maki, it really depends on how much the governor or mayors love sport. Actually, that's how it's supposed to be. The mayor or governor are the ones who are supposed to promote sports in their uh, litis. And, you know, maybe the reason why they don't uh, do so is because of the lack of understanding of what sports can really offer to their constituents and to their, to their uh, areas. Uh, as I said, because we always focus on medals, winning the next uh, Olympic medal or so and so on and so forth, we neglect what it can do to the general population, not only in terms of physical fitness or uh, bio physiological uh, health, but also in terms of character, in terms of unity, in terms of cohesion, in terms of uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, Actually, community programs will have to be uh, promoted primarily because it is this, it is in this way that we are able to promote camarad camaraderie among the members of a particular community. If you will always look at sports as uh, a contest for winners, how many winners will come out versus how many uh, so-called losers? will come out of a particular part, uh, comp, uh, competition. When that is your purpose, it becomes divisive. Many times you also end up with people who will try to uh, uh, go around rules and regulations. But if you were to focus on what sports can be in terms of participation, in terms of personal development, in terms of how you can 
develop your executive decisions and uh, and all the other traits that are not necessarily physiological, then you are you may end up with a better citizenry as compared to what we have now. Uh, we were be, we were trained to be audiences. We were trained to go one side, Ginebra versus uh, uh, San Miguel versus Ganito, ganyan. When sports can actually unite us when we participate rather than watch. So that's, I, I feel that it's, it really has to be promoted as such by the governors, by the mayors, even by the barangay chair people. Okay, uh, thank you, Sir Herc, for that um, comment. And also thank you, uh, B. Go of Rappler for the talk. So, we, um, so that ends up our first part. We would like to thank everyone who participated both on Zoom on face and on Facebook by co-hosts, um, and, uh, Andrew and Zoe williams Piri from um, Athletics Australia. Um, also, uh, Mackie McRae from Wewoods College in Nueva Vizcaya for our as our reactor, and also to Professor Christian Wisdom Valiasur of UP College of Human Kinetics as one of our reactors as also. So we would like to thank as well everyone participated for this forum. We have um, gained enough um, wisdom, especially in these ty trying times, and we hope that through our discernment and through our uh, meaningful experiences in the field of athletics or in sport, that we can continue to guide our community in this challenging time. So, we can, na kailangan nating uh, mag at magkaroon ng pagkakataon na makagaod tayo papunta sa ating ano, sa, papunta nating goals. And I agree on the development of sport for all, that we do sport as a way of life and not just for showing off. And it also speaks about really um, cultural change. Kung mataas ang ating pagpapahalaga sa sport na hindi lamang siya libangan, kundi as a way pamumuhay para maging healthy, para maging maayos at malakas ang ating mga kabataan. Huwag natin silang sanayin na lumalaro, lumalaro lamang dahil sa premium, sa kompetisyon, kundi para sa sarili nila, para mas maging mabuti silang tao at makabahagi uh, ng ating lipunan. Muli, uh, marami pong salamat. And again, thank you, Sir Herc, for um, accommodating us. It's been also a great reunion for us in UP. And I'm thankful as well because of thank your you. mentorship on a personal note that uh, I was able to um, have what I have now. Um, of course, maliit pa rin, but of course, it's still um, worth it than <laughs> our discussions during my time as a Araling Panlipunan student to human kinetics. It's a very 360 degree turn on a personal note. So, salamat. And again, to those who want to stay on Zoom, by, for our Q&A, you can do so. But for our presenters and reactors, you can also leave um, upon your convenience. So, maraming salamat, Sir Herc, and thank you for joining us on our first part of our track talk at Pinoy Athletics. Muli, mabuhay po tayong lahat. Ingat po tayo at mabuhay ang atletang Pilipino. Marami pong salamat. God bless. So, yes, okay po. So, we continue with our Q&A um, online. So while well, Sir Herc, if you would like to leave the forum, it's a, um, you yeah. can do so at your own convenience. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank so you. we are now... Okay, salamat din po. So we continue to shout out. Yes, uh, we continue to shout out to everyone who are joining us on uh, Facebook Live. Um, we would like also to acknowledge... Um, Nag-shout out tayo, Coach Ernie Candelario, our SEA Games channel. Champion, also Nino University Games Champion as well, who joined us on Facebook Live. We are now doing dual, dual uh, platform kasi and on Facebook. Uh, Maki, uh, salamat din sa pagpunta and um, also wisdom. Salamat din. So we still continue our discussion. Um, thank you, Bigo of Rappler earlier as well. So now, Andrew, we can go on to our um, Facebook Live for questions. So um, earlier, by the way, we have also thought on um, from from a coach who uh, commented on our group about the training drills. So perhaps we can give light as well to those who. Are, by the way, um, those who are not known, not, doesn't know yet our Facebook group. You can follow us Facebook at 
uh, Facebook page and also our Facebook group. We are now ranging now to 23,000 members on our Facebook group. So we hope that we, you can reach further to our, um, in serving our, the Philippine Athletics community. We are here all of you in our, our capacity as an online blog. Again, we are giving you information up and you can discern and have the discretion how you um, how you will consider it. We are open to your questions, comments, pinoyathletics.info or my personal email, arnel.abar at protonmail.com or pinoyathletics at gmail.com. Andrew, uh, perhaps we can discuss a little on the on the um, comment on the paces of the drills that um, one of our colleagues from Australia commented last um, last night. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm friends with uh, Coach Russ from Australia. Um, he he is a pretty successful coach um, from Western Australia, currently based in Indonesia right now. Um, he does raise some valid points um, regarding the drills, which I will comment on. Um, uh, the thing is with the drills that have been displayed on the website is that um, they're more like, you know, stage three type drills. So you have to go through the development phase. The main concern is that um, people are seeing the drills on our page without knowing the initial steps that were needed to get to those drills. Um, like without the initial steps that are needed to get to those drills. So it's effectively going straight from, um, you know, like progression, A, B, C. Like it's like just going straight to C without knowing what A and B was to get to C. So the fear is that, um, you know, a lot of beginner type athletes might just jump straight to those just trying to copy those drills without doing the learning steps that come before. Um, personally, um, I can't really comment too much on the drills themselves because um, each coach has their own different system. And, you know, I don't personally, I don't do any of those type of drills um, with my progressive drill set. Um, so I'm not really familiar with uh, coach Fatima's program. I believe that, um, you know, regarding those drills, um, like we'd have to ask Coach Fatima, like her philosophy, her purpose of doing those drills and, you know, what her objectives are. I, I, I honestly don't know Coach Fatima personally, so I don't really know what her system is. Um, all, I'm mainly the point I'm bringing up is when we teach drills, um, we need to make sure that there's a sequence of, you know, getting from A to B to C with the more basic drills, the more medium level drills to the more advanced level drills. So that was uh, Coach Russ's primary concern is that we're posting drills and we should be, um, you know, like bringing the other steps in that came before to get to those particular drills. Okay, yes. Um, also, of course, I'm the one who posted this. It's really about to give the context to everyone. Um, of course, there are some not yet caught on video on those videos. Of course, there's the form of some other forms of stretching on that. And also, perhaps, um, it's really a very, um, of course, it's we only participated in the two ses training sessions during the time because we have limited time. But of course, for the benefit of people, I can see um, other ways of uh, uh, the training. So, that's why we pointed it out. But of course, we are and of course, we appreciate the comment of Coach Ross on that. It's greatly noted. And um, we hope that uh, we can still continue our discussion. That's why we have a contest. And that's why we are here to really um, try to have um, different points of view on training. Because we want to have this. And I appreciate that. And that's also the thing. Because we know the fact that there are many funding and programs and we would like them to benefit on this kind of healthy discussion. So that's the reason why for um, for everyone's attention that we posted that those kind of things. So that's the benefit of that. So I hope it also clears yeah. the context of why we posted that. Because that's about for discussion. It's not uh, close and yes or no, but more of a discussion and opinion share. Because that's where learning is. Because of course, we cannot 
really provide a one all of the for example we cannot really provide a, like a full length video of a course if we posted one of those who done by Rudiger Harkson of Germany with the Czech Athletics Federation on YouTube. So perhaps you can also reiterate that uh, uh, body if we can um, post that because it's a, uh, like a one hour video of everything. Can so I just, that, that um, reiterate what, what, what I was trying, the point I was trying to get across. You know, like someone such as myself or Coach Russ or Coach Russ, for example. Um, Coach Russ knows that these are level three type drills and he basically you know, if he's looking, if you're looking into a window and you see, you know, in this case, the video and you see, and he sees the drills, he knows that there are step, he knows that, you know, that you have, you can't just go and copy drills straight away. You need to go through the other learning steps first. However, um, people who are beginners who are on our site, who are looking at these videos may just go out and copy the drills without doing the other learning process steps. I mean, a more experienced coach such as Russ would know, you know, that there are steps, but not everybody who watches the videos knows that there are steps to go through before getting to that level of competency with, uh, with drills. Yes, I understand. So nevertheless, uh, we can, um, first of all, we will post more, um, more full-length video next time. That's why I mentioned about the one, the one that uh, you're facilitated in athletes. So I think that's the complete one. So we can also point, point at that one as well. Yeah, it would be good to get some, um, you know, some videos from Coach Rudiger, considering that he's worked with, you know, from Germany, considering his work with some world-class level, you know, like hurdlers. It would be good to actually get some videos from him um, in order to aid with the coaching experience. Yes, yes. Actually, I ha uh, it's on YouTube, on the Czech Athletic Federation page, uh, so we can link that to us as well. It's yeah. a whole, like you are, so it means it's a whole training cycle. So, yeah. and, and now, what's Coach uh -huh. Rudiger, can you just um, briefly just reiterate the high-level athletes he's worked with? You know, like the, you know, you said that he's worked with um, a couple of Olympians and a world bronze medalist, I believe. Um, hurdles. Can you just yeah, reiterate yeah. the um, who he's worked? With? Okay. Yeah. Um, so far, um, he worked with uh, two of the Olympians from the from Germany. Um, um, and uh, from 1984 LA in 1988 Olympics, and also currently he's the na member of the national coaching team for sprint and hurdle and the. Uh, Head of the athletics department, the department of MTG Mannheim, where um, the current um, one of the top javelin throwers in, in Germany, uh, Andreas Hoffmann, is also training, and also um, other jumpers and hurdlers. Uh, and he's a level four uh, lecturer for I think um, World Athletics and also German Athletics Federation. Because for the public's attention, they offer as well. Um, they have the DMP Academy, their uh, federation. So they have this really a full time school for aspiring athletics coaches. So he's one of the lecturers. So primarily, these athletes that Coach Rudiger worked with on the world level were they mainly? They would mainly are they mainly um, high hurdlers like 100, 110 hurdles? Like um, these, yes. These, oh, yes. They're both, yeah. Uh, so it's had the most success high hurdlers, in other words. Yeah, yeah. If you if you were to say what event has he had the best success in at the high level, it would be the one and the one ten hurdles. Yes, yes, as, that's right. He's produced level and he's produced some Olympic qualifying type performances, and of course, it's not easy to qualify for the Olympics. Yes, exactly. And, and so, even now, but it's still difficult but even back then. Exactly. So that's a very, very interesting thought. That's why it's very important that we continue one way or another. So, so to give idea again, uh, one moment, I will share again. I think time. that um, as coaches, um, we should welcome any um, quality feedback from other coaches. Um, I mean, it would even be interesting to have a 
discussion with Coach Fatima about how her how she runs, you know, like how she does her program to get some more insight into how, you know, like what her training philosophies are, how she, um, why she does these particular drills, what the objectives are. It would be good because you know, as coaches, we should all really be learning from each other. And in my view, um, most of you know, like like every coach is still learning and you know like every coach is still finding new ways to adapt things at the same time every coach seems to have their own particular style of coaching um but yeah it would be interesting to get her insights into or i guess we need more videos in particular or something to that extent um yeah yes yes but i believe feedback or criticism or whatever because at the end of the day it improves um our coaching ability like having that open mind when it comes to opinions and ideas when it comes to coach when it comes to coaching of course like every coach has their own ideas and opinions of how things work but you know like it's good to be able to share that knowledge and yeah i fully agree with you and al um in regards to, you know, what you said about more discussions, more, um, you know, more sharing of knowledge, that sort of thing. Yes, buddy. that's the reason why we have this kind of uh, forums, especially that most people are tuned in. And again, we would like to shout out those who, are, who joined us on board on Facebook Live. Dom Clear um, of FEBU and John Bautista of Panaku City, one um, um, who participated in the 2019 National Open. I think she's one of the youngest. She's from Panaku City, um, 30, 40 years old. So, um, and then we will still uh, continue to accommodate your comments and questions. We have another 20 minutes to answer um, questions which are fired in the way of coaching or any other queries to do with Pinoy Athletics. We have another 20 or so minutes left, maximum. Yes, okay. And also to announce again, buddy, what we, who will be our guest for, um, for Tuesday. So our guests are as follows. Let me share the screen. So, of yep. course, our good friend, um, Coach Henry Dugmill, uh, our Olympian, um, for the benefit of all, can you cite to us the, some busy statistics or like what he has to hold for, for his career? Sorry, um, you wanted me to say a few things about... Uh, yes, yes, about, about Coach Henry. Yeah, yeah about okay. his uh, achievement and... Yeah, about like, improvement. Yeah. So, yeah. like, on a personal note, I, I've known um, Henry for the best part of almost 20 years. Like, I, I was at Mapua with him. You know, like, um, at, you know, we were teammates at Mapua, so I know the guy quite well. Um, yeah, yeah, so, firstly, um, just going through Henry's achievements, the biggest uh, turning point for Henry, um, you know, was that, he went to the 2003 SEA Games as a triple jumper. He didn't do so well. He basically got removed from the national team. Then the next year, he came back in 2004. And um, he broke the... You know, he came back, you know, like most people, if they get sort of let go of the team or something, a lot of them just pack up and, you know, quit and they don't want anything to do with the sport anymore. But Henry, that was really a catalyst for him after he performed so poorly at the 2003 Sea Games and the triple jump. He really wanted in his mind to prove that, you know, that he was basically worthy of representing the country. So the next year, 2004, he came back and the national record in the long jump had stood since 1936. It was the oldest record on the books. He came back and he smashed the national record in 2004. He, he, the record was 7.65. He came out and he jumped 7.83 in 2004. He went on after that to be, um, become the SEA uh, Games champion in 2005. 2011, he was a medalist, but, you know, like the... Uh, there was another very good uh, jumper, for an eight-meter guy from Thailand who came up. So it was very difficult. He wasn't able to get his gold in nine and 11. But he came back in 2013 at the age of um, 32. 
and you know he, he basically took the title again. So he he's a three time Sea Games gold medalist, um, national PB of seven meters ninety nine, uh, and he's also um, you know he also qualified for the two thousand eight Olympics. I, I'm not sure if he's been to two. I know he's definitely had at least one. You know the two thousand eight. Currently now he's uh, doing sports admin and he's coaching in um, uh, his home province of Cotabato. And uh, he's also a rep for, you know, a regional director for the Patafa. And now he's also a, uh, a PSC regional administrator. Yep. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, okay, we continue with the questions. We are now browsing the Facebook page because I think that's where most of our audience. So shout out. This. So last one, okay, uh, the age of the athlete and training age of to be taken into consideration. As that group of Europe could be well, well be could well be trained to the level of this that they are doing. If these things are mentioned, then it will give coaches a better understanding standing as to whether this is applicable to the artist they might be coaching. Paul Anthony Paduria Diaz, ever wonder why, why Americans were strong in distance running are white? There are black, uh, blacks or Africans, but are naturalists like Mab and Bernhard. So we, hope, uh, we will also consider the discussion of the long distance in the near future. So then, of course, uh, we have a very why? good um, resource speaker on that, but then we will take note of that. You can browse on the Facebook page, um, live stream for your comments and questions, especially from um, Coach Ralph Gila and then Paul Anthony Diaz, who are also on board on the Facebook. Yeah, I see that he, he asked about um, Americans strong in distance running while there are blacks, but are naturalized like Meb and um, Bernard. You know, like, can I answer that in, in, a, in a way? Sure, yeah. Go on, buddy. Yeah, okay. Look at it this way, right? A lot of the blacks in America are West Africans. They came over um, from West Africa. Most of the strong African runners are East Africans. They're like Kenyans, uh, Ethiopians, from Somalians, from that part of the world, right? So you know, these guys like... Bernard, I'm not sure about Meb, I don't know too much about him, but if we're talking about Bernard Laggett, he's Kenyan, he ran for Kenya, and he ran for Kenya for so many years, and he moved over to the United States to run for them, he's East African. Most of the blacks in America are West Africans, which are more, you know, their genetics are more suited towards sprints, so that's mm -hmm. why I think that most of the best, you know, white, most of the best runners in America are more the white runners because there's not really, you know, like most of the, the blacks in America are descendants of West Africans. Like that's why also in the Caribbean, that's why mo you don't really see that many good distance runners from the Caribbean as well, because they have that West African fast twitch genetic material, which has been brought across rather than that East African um, you know, the East Africans tend to be genetically better in the, uh, in the uh, distance. So because there's few East Africans in America, the white athletes sort of play that genetic role. But on the global scale, if you compare, you know, Kenyan and Ethiopian East African runners to the best white runners in the United States, you know, like there's a for example, of Kenya, there's like something like about a hundred um, Kenyan runners who, who have hit this qualifying standard for the Olympic Games. If we were to look at the figures, you know, how many white American runners have hit the marathon standard for the Olympic Games, the, the numbers would be a lot, you know, I don't have the exact figures for that, but it wouldn't be anywhere near a hundred. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. You know, that's basically just a general idea. I mean, I, I can't really go into the science of things. So I'm not really that qualified to go into the science of it, but that's a general assumption, what I've basically said. Yeah, exactly. So that would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, by the way, we are also going to invite you on our next Tuesday talk. It will be 
very interesting to see more people. So, um, we still have 10 minutes, buddy, before we end our session. So, um, so far, we are all the events in here in the European setting are um, scheduled for September and October. For example, the Diamond League that I um, for we know are um, that is planned to be in Vienna to participate in the in So, um, for the public attention, we try our best to be covered live um, on the spot at least. Um, the event of EJ Obian, if he will participate in the Diamond League in, in Monaco or in, in Paris and other places, um, in other European cities, at least we are here on board. So, and then, of course, um, by the way, the World Athletics body, as I sent to you last night, we have already now the updated qualification calendar for Olympic Games. So, did you already browse it, if I'm not mistaken? I haven't looked at it yet, but my question is, um, and I've read about this, is the um, the organisers still going, like anyone who's already qualified for the Olympic Games, right, because obviously it's a different qualification period, like yeah. anyone who's already qualified for the Olympic Games, such as EJ or Bienna, who's already made the standard, they don't have to qualify again, right? They're, since they've qualified, yeah. they are now safe to go to the next you know yes, yes. to be qualified they don't have to hit the qualification standard again if they've already hit it that's what i'm what i'm saying mind you they probably will but what i'm saying is like you know, some athletes may be in the awkward situation where they've hit the standard and then so that, that won't be a problem if they've hit the the qualification period has been extended rather than being reset yeah, yeah. okay yes okay. Okay. so yeah from january 1 2019 to the 5th of April 2020 and from December 1 to 2019. So that means that any qualifications, which are unlikely because there were no competitions, if there were any qualifications made between April 5 and December 1 of 2020 are not validated, but it's unlikely there's going to be any competitions in that period or may, there might be a few competitions. So if you had a qualification, between the 5th of April and the 1st of December 2020, that basically means you're outside of the qualifying period. Yes, yes. I think uh, most, most of the competitions here in Europe, as far as what we are hearing informally, excuse me, are, are, will be done in September, October. I think, the one in I think they are scheduled on 8th of September because it's an I have World Athletics Challenge um, um, sanction. And so I think yeah. it will okay. so what this means based on the document you've sent me is that you know that meet in Monaco is on August the fourteenth. And you know, like as far as EJ's EJ as far as it's in concern of EJ, he's already hit the standard, right? So yes. no matter how he does in, on August the fourteenth, it's not going to affect his qualifications to the Olympic Games. But what I'm saying is if you're an athlete who hasn't qualified yet and you hit the qualification on August the 14th, according to this, um, these guidelines, you won't, that won't be a qualification meet because it says that only between, it says that between April and December, um, mm -hmm. that that's not a qualification period according to this, uh, according yes, to yes, these yes. guidelines. And and also for the public yeah, yeah. Yes. At least to give you an idea, what is the what are the standards of uh, for the for the Olympic Games to qualify aside from the token qualification for NOC or for every federation are as follows. So you can notice how tough to qualify officially for the Olympic Games. So those are the standards. Yeah, these yes. standards have not softened or changed. They they remain so the far, same. Go ahead. Yes. And, mm, yes. And so far, um, who among our, aside from EJ, uh, I think so far the one that is trying to qualify for is Christina No for the uh, women's uh, uh, Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, with, with the athletes, uh, just the qualifying, if I, I'm just looking through these in, um, in a sequence order. Yeah, Christina Knott's run 2301. She needs 2280 to qualify, so she's not too far off. I mean, she's running 11.40, so, you know, 20 to 80, 
like should be, you know, that 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 should. Be. Looking at, I'm just looking through these events. So, like, I mean, I'm scrolling down past a lot of these track events. You know, I already scrolled down to the well, 400 hurdles. So, the the qualification for the Olympics and the men's 400 hurdles is 48.90. Eric Cray's PB uh, back in 2016 is 48.98. So, if I mean, if Eric can find another set of legs and you know get in at 32, get back into um, you know, PB shape, then that's another possibility. I mean, the Pataf has already highlighted him in their possible qualifiers. Um, looking at these other events, so I'm just scrolling down past Stephen's pole vault. Uh, Natalie Oi has jumped, I think it's 430, and, you know, 470 is, like, quite a bit of work in terms of what needs to be done. I mean, she's got, she's lucky she has longer to qualify now. So, you know, she's got more time to go towards that particular standard. Uh, jump, jump, or the shot put. Yeah, the shot put, um, 21.10. Um, Morrison has thrown, I think it's 20.40. So he's, it's good. He's got a bit more time to qualify as well. It gives him that more of that chance to sort of get into meets that he needs to get into to sort of hit those standards. Um, hammer, javelin, decathlon, walks. Okay, now the women's marathon. As far as uh, two women marathoners go, um, I read an article the other day that Tabell has already said that that two twenty nine thirty is already much too tough. I mean, she's run she's run a PB her PB is two forty three. That's forty minutes. Um, so the other thing that they're looking at for the marathon women is like they're looking at get qualify. This isn't this is what this is the main way to qualify, but there's another way to qualify which is through. A Bailey, based on yeah. um, points from I would, I would looking at, yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can show me them, but like honestly, I can't. I, I it would take me more time than we have now to be able yeah. to sort of like interpret what it all means. I mean, yeah, yeah. The qualifying standards are easy to understand. You either have them or you don't have them, but they're really tough now. So yeah, this other method of qualification, it's um, it's a bit complicated, but it's another way in which athletes can qualify. So um, you know, Tabell has already indicated in a article that just came out that that two twenty nine is really tough, and she needs to qualify by the other method, which is basically getting into you know like meets which give her a certain number of points and so she can compete in enough meets to accumulate enough points to get in to the olympics uh you know as like through that second means of uh qualification yes yeah that's right so yes i think for the, for the highlight and then so um, we we are now needing our um, um, end of uh, of our discussion. So thank you again for all your comments. Thank you, thank you. all the people who join. A bit and the rest of Miriam College join in. Shout out po lang. Jantina Dilip Navidad, our Malaking athlete for the Philippine national team, also joined in our Facebook group. So again, uh, before we go, we would like again to invite you, ladies and gentlemen, our um, to our uh, forum on Tuesday, uh, which is um, the... one moment. So, so it will be with uh, Coach Henry Dagnil of South Cotabato, and also a regional development officer of the Factor Region. So, we hope that you that you can us for our discussion. Um, on Tuesday again. So this is our announcement. So we end up we end now our um, track talk Thursday again on Tuesdays. It's um we have uh, Coach Henry Dagnil and next Thursday it will be another open mic forum for everyone. So we hope you can join So we end up with everybody and see you next time. Okay. Thank you. God bless.
God bless and mabuhay ang atletang Pilipino. Salamat po. Okay, and our...